And Joe, do you want to intro? Oh, we've got yeah, I can start. Uh, so my name is, uh, is Joseph Kane. I am a certified sommelier in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I work at a restaurant that's called Bacchus, uh, which uh, is named after the Roman god of wine. And uh, it's certainly, you know, what I consider to be the best wine program in the state of Wisconsin. Just it's, it's a really fun place to work. Uh, it's a restaurant that's in the, in the Bartolotta restaurant group and um, been there for just a couple of years uh, running the wine program and, and assistant general manager there. Um, Prior to that, I was a, uh, a store manager at Waterford Wine and Spirits at, at the Delafield location. So I'm sure that's how a lot of you uh, got to know me is, is, is working at Waterford, which as you know, I'm incredibly passionate about wine. Uh, really enjoyed my time there so much that I really never quit. I always just kept showing up and you know would just do odd jobs and get paid in wine, which is a, it's a fun thing. Um, so thank you guys, uh, the Waterfordians uh, that signed up tonight. It's, it's a pleasure having you here. And, um, but primarily, you know, my background has been in restaurants. Um, we talked last time about uh, uh, how Amy and I met. We um, just knew each other virtually uh, during COVID. We actually have mutual friends um, through the, the Twin Cities Somalia group. Um, and then I jumped on a couple of things through that group with uh, educational formats and Amy and I got to know each other and we started talking and it's like we are, are, are passive crossed in all these different areas in the Somalia world, but we never actually like formally met, which is kind of funny. It's just like two, two ships passing in the night, right? Like we were both at TechSom together. We did competitions together, but never bumped into each other. And, and now we're, we're, you know, German wine ambassadors for 2020. And it's just thr thrilling. And I, I love working with her and conversating her, uh, with her about wine. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, we're happy to be here, here tonight. And then Amy, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about what you have going on now. Yeah, I think that that's such a fun story story because yeah, we it. were at, we've been at the same place at the same time in like competing against each other yeah. <laughs> and we just right. didn't know the other one and so um it took covid for us how interesting that covid connects people as we're all connected tonight um it took covid for us to connect virtually and now we've been working together and it's been great yeah. um hello everyone for all you uh, Wisconsinites and some of the France 44 friends on here that don't know me. My name is Amy Waller. I work at France 44 Wine and Spirits in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am the sommelier or one of the sommeliers and also the group sales manager. So I sell virtual events, sort of like this one. I sell them privately. Um, we my, my background is also in restaurants. Um, I most recently was the wine director at The Bachelor Farmer in Minneapolis. And some of you might know me from there. And um, I was there for a long time. That's where I really started diving into the German wines and finding out that there are so many options. I never knew that they were so price friendly and that they were so, hmm, I'm gonna another one coming in. Um, so price friendly and so versatile for everything and amazing food pairing wines. And through my time at the Bachelor Farmer, that's where I got connected with um, Stephen and Danielle and Wines of Germany. And here we are tonight. I really, um, I pitched this idea of German Reds in October because I, my, um, my partner's mother couldn't believe that their Germany made red wine. She had no idea. And so I thought, I bet no one else knows that Germany makes really high quality, beautiful food friendly red wines. And so here we are tonight. Yeah. Should we run through the, the wine list for everybody? Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I'll go first. If you're in Minneapolis tonight, you've got three really amazing wines. All three that I work with at France 44, but all three of these I also worked with at the restaurant, at the Bachelor Farmer. I had all of these on the list at one point in time. So first up is 2019 Warrior. That's how I say it, uh, Drawlinger. Second one is 2016 Darden Pinot Meunier or Schwartz Riesling. And you can see I spilled a little. It happens to all of us. And the third one is 2018 Meyer Nagel Schwabbergunder or Pinot Noir. Joe, what do you got in yeah. Wisconsin? You got a pretty good lineup rocking there. So um, 
First wine that I have here is, let's see, it's a little bit bright there. Let me bring it back. It's a Via Wolf by Ernst uh, Lowison. It is a Dornfelder from the Faults that we featured in our last event as well. Um, and then same as you, I got a Darting Pinot Meunier. And I hope I got the same vintage. I have 17 here. Um, delicious yes. wine. It's my first intro in introduction to it. It's been this event and I'm just blown away by it, which we'll talk a lot more about uh, moving forward. And then I got uh, Julia Bertram uh, Spot Burgunder, which is also from the R um, and really kind of a cool tie to Meyer Nagel that we'll get into in a little bit. But this wine, if you guys had the pleasure of picking it up at the store is absolutely remarkable. And I'm definitely going to be using this wine at Bacchus for, for pairing menu and stuff like that. Like I'm super jazzed about it. And you'll hear me go on and on about it in about 45 minutes. So, yeah. Well, that brings up a good point that if you're going to use that wine at your restaurant, why don't we have the same wines tonight? So that's a good question, right? So like, why don't we have the same wines tonight is that there's a little bit of different distribution that goes on between, you know, Midwestern states. And unfortunately, you know, Wisconsin is still viewed upon as kind of being that flyover state, right? And we don't get a lot of love with certain things. We get access to really cool wines, but then other ones we don't. And, and it's difficult with German red wine because it just, there's not a lot of it that's made as, as opposed to like other, other countries. And um, there's a lot of our distributors that just aren't bringing more of it in. And that's why we do these things. Like that's why we do these educational things to hopefully open up people to, to get into these kind of wines that we're super excited about. And then the more that, that you guys buy, the more that our distributors will bring in and kind of like it be able to showcase in the market. So um, not to say that we're absolute crusaders for German red wine, but that's kind of what we're doing here. And, and hopefully it kind of can, can turn some heads in, in Wisconsin and, and, and show you guys just how good that these wines can be for sure. We are sort of crusaders, aren't we? I guess so, right? Like, we don't want to take that much credit for it, but we kind of are. <laughs> yeah, we bit. can be crusaders. I'm okay yeah. with that. Okay with that. Right. Um, yeah. Just to let everybody know some of the ground rules, and there aren't a lot of them. There are no rules, essentially, except if you want to talk, go ahead and talk. This is meant to be conversational, but also we got a lot of stuff to get through. If you have a question, you want to throw it in the chat. We'll run through those as they come up, or you can save your questions for the end. Totally up to you. Um, second is go ahead and drink. We're yeah, going to talk through a lot of things, and you should go ahead and enjoy your wine as you want to enjoy it. They're meant to go in an order, like the order that we um, announce them in. But also, if you work ahead, hey, go for it. Get ahead of the group. We're fine with that. Um, any other rules, Joe? I think that's it. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. The rule number one is like, just make sure you got some, so your glass is full with wine and that you're smelling back and forth and tasting back and forth and stuff like that. And yeah. And please feel free to, um, to chime in on the chat. We'll be monitoring that. And don't feel like if you're, if you're thinking of something, chances are somebody else in this group is, is thinking of the same question. So don't, don't be apprehensive or, or hesitant. You know, this is definitely um, a little bit more formal than our last one, but still pretty casual, right, Amy? Like, I mean, we're just here to kind of hang out and drink wine. So yeah. yeah. Steven's already working ahead. Steven, <laughs> Good. well done. You should well get done. into it and just do a little cheers or prost. Yeah, absolutely. Tonight, everybody. Prost. Clinky. All right. Clinky. Yeah, clink, clink. Clinky, drinky. Good. I know. All right. Let's get into it. Let's do it. Don't. I'm all about it. Start us okay. off, Germany. So, uh, yeah. I, so, I, I think what we want to talk about, Amy, and we, we chatted a little bit last night over the phone, and we, we, we got, I got a question from, uh, from an attendee and, and I'm sorry that I forgot your name, but uh, it's such a common question with, with German wines. And I think it's just like, let's just talk about the elephant in the room right away and get it out of the way. Um, so the question was, is why is there this misconception that all German wines are sweet or all German wines are, are white wines that are sweet? And I think that's a great question for us, for us to tackle. And this is kind of how I answered it in the email is that, well, you know, the majority of German white wine is actually fermented dry. It's just Americans that consume so much sweeter wine because we, we love sweeter things, right? We drink Coca-Cola and, and sweet sodas and we're just naturally kind of gravitate towards that. And I absolutely, you know, I, I love dry wines in Germany, but I also equally really like 
sweet wines of Germany too. But yeah, it is is definitely a misconception. I would think too. Um, another kind of elephant in the room is that there were there was a time where that's what was getting produced at a mass level for German wine. And it was it was very common to see that in store shelves on, on big box grocery stores. So I think that's what that's the only thing that people thought that that Germany had to offer, which obviously is not true. And, and we'll definitely get into a little bit more. But um, do you think that's a fair assessment on how I answer that, Amy? Would you agree? Or, or do you have anything else you'd like to to um, chime in about in that regard? Um, I think that's I, I think I think there's there's this conception that they, oh, they're, they're all sweet. They're not. The sweet ones are very, very good, and they have just such a long history in the wine world, which is amazing. And, and as you can imagine, I mean, the history of Germany uh, runs, you know, very deep, uh, you know, back to to, to Roman area, uh, Roman times, and um, really cool. And you know, one of the most fascinating things to me is that you know, us as sommeliers, when we studied Burgundy, like one of the first things you learn about is is monks that farm the vineyards and Benedictine and Cistercian orders, but they did the same thing in Germany which is really kind of cool. And, and what they brought to, to Germany was two of my favorite grape varieties, which is Riesling and Pinot Noir. And, and that's how it all really kind of got started, you know, in, in Germany. And, um, you know, obviously there was a little bit more of a focus on white wines and that was just, you know, very popular uh, to be able to export to England and, and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, you know, Riesling was incredibly popular. It was, it was the, the most expensive wine on the, on the wine list of the Titanic, right? Like a Ryan Hessen Riesling. And I just think that that history is so cool. Um, obviously, you know, Germany, you know, post-World War, you know, World War One, World War Two, definitely, you know, had an effect on, on how much wine they could export and stuff like that. And there's people that, you know, um, that, that wouldn't buy anything. And then they kind of had to reinvent themselves you know, certainly in the 1950s, and, and they did that with, with you know, different grape crossings and, and stuff that they could plant a lot of and and, and was cold hardy and, and stuff. And then, um, you know, I, I feel like Germany is just like every couple of decades or so is kind of reinventing what they're doing. But the whole time, you know, recent is always going to be the star of the show. We're not, we're not, you know, ever going to disagree with that. But it's just really kind of cool to see, you know, these young winemakers that are, that are up and coming and doing just such cool stuff with red grape varieties. I'm thrilled about it. And um, I just think it's really cool. The more you're able to explore, um, the more you can find out, which you don't, you're not able to do that a lot in old world countries, right? Like they're not changing anything in Burgundy. They're not like, hey, let's try, you know, let's try planting this new grape variety in Burgundy. It's always going to be Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. That, and that's it. And it's always going to be the same, the same, you know, uh, Italian wine laws for DOCGs in, in Piedmont, right? Like that's the way it's going to be, which is fine. Those wines are fantastic. But I really think it's cool that you're seeing a little bit of exploration in a, a wine can, uh, country that's just so deep rooted in history is, is, is really kind of cool for yeah. sure. So yeah, too. absolutely. And um, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about, you know, we're, we're, this isn't a just discussion about white versus red. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, we know, you know, those of us here know that Riesling is a dominant grape variety in Germany, but I guess, you know, I never really knew, just how much uh, Pinot Noir or Spapergunder was planted in Germany. It's crazy. You know, when we were talking yesterday, Amy and I, as far as like, you know, sommelier questions that would pop up on exams. And, um, you know, if, if a question popped up is like, what grape variety is more heavily planted between Muller Thurgau and, um, and Spapergunder in Germany, every single sommelier would, would answer Muller Thurgau. And they're actually even. There's an equal amount of Pinot Noir versus Muller Turgot. I think I find that to be absolutely mind blowing. The reason why is that it's, I feel it's a lot easier maybe to cultivate Muller Turgot. And that's why they, they came up with it in the first place in, in Germany versus Pinot Noir, which we know can be just a really fickle grape and, and really, you know, hard to grow. It's, it's got to have just perfect climate and sight and exposure and everything like that. So I think it's a real testament to, to, um, to winemakers and grape growers in Germany that, that they're, I'm producing that much Pinot Noir at a really good level too, like really good quality for sure. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's something to, to definitely be excited about. Um, and, and hopefully this, uh, this explanation can kind of go, you know, a little bit deeper, you know, um, you know, we talked last, you know, last time about, uh, you know, the Pinot Noir production in, in Germany is being, being third worldwide, you know, next to, to France and in the United States. And, and I never would have thought that. I don't know what other country I would have thought would produce more, but it just is, there's an abundance of it and just really good quality, which I think is cool. Um, you know, other key varieties that we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to talk about Dornfelder for sure, um, which is, you know, is, is another planted grape variety 
um, Portugueser, Trollinger, which I, I think Amy's definitely going to dive into because she's she's all about it. Wemberger, which is one of my favorite grape varieties, aka Blau Frankish. You know, I love Austrian reds and, and Blau Frankish definitely is, is the best that I feel like they have to offer. And then Pinot Meunier, you know, we're getting into Schwartz Riesling and, and Pinot Meunier to talk about, um, which again is just is, is it a really cool grape variety if you like this like light and elegant but just like it has fruit and it has balance and just a, a, just a fun wine to drink right like we're you know all of us are going to get into it because we all have darting hopefully in our glasses right now and i think it's uh yeah really delicious so yeah i don't know if there's anything else i can really cover amy do you want to dive in you want to start talking about some wine regions here yeah, let's get into the Württemberg. Cool. So yeah, so we're talking about three wine regions in particular, Württemberg, um, the, the Faults and the R. And uh, I don't have a wine from the Württemberg, you guys. So I think Amy's just going to take this ball and run with it. <laughs> I am for a little bit. Perfect. Um, first of all, if you're in Minnesota, you have got Trollinger from the Württemberg in your glass. Drink that up. It's candied and beautiful and delicious. And we're going to get into that in a little bit, but I'm really enjoying this wine. And so I just had to say that super light bodied. Wow, wow, wow. We're going there. Um, you'll see on the screen and uh, most of you got mapped separately, um, but we kind of blew up that section of Württemberg. Württemberg is also called Swabia. It's the fourth largest wine growing region in Germany and the most dominant in red grape varieties. It's planted about 68% to um, red grape varieties. And most of these, about 80% of the plantings are actually produced by cooperatives. So what that means for you is that a lot of this red wine doesn't leave Germany. It stays there, they drink it, they love their wines of their region. Just like, you know, if you live in Oregon, Oregonians, drink Oregon wine, same with California. And so in Württemberg, they drink their own wine, not very much leaves. Most of it is produced by cooperatives. And then you've got a handful of really incredible producers and importers. Importers are so important. So two of my favorite importers, one, in, well, three, we've got Skernick, they're responsible for all three of these wines. So we've got Von Boden, we've got Skernick, and we've got the German wine collection here. We're lucky to have them because they go in and they find these beautiful gems and they bring them to us, which is so amazing. Um, not a lot of the wine leaves there. What did I miss? Hmm. It is a really warm region. And most of the red wines that are produced here, um, you'll see a lot of Pinot Noir coming out of the Baden, which is right next to it there. But most of the wines that are coming out of the Württemberg are super light and quaffable and fruity. And they're meant to be I know it's a French term, but they're meant to be glue glue wines, right? They're meant to be drank every night of the week. And I think that the wine we're drinking right now in our glass certainly um, certainly illustrates that point pretty well. Light bodied, beautiful, fresh, certainly chillable. Joe, do you want to get into the other red varieties? Yeah, I'd love to. So. Um... So I didn't realize, so it's fourth largest wine growing region in Germany, um, but really kind of red dominant, right? So we're talking about uh, Trollinger right now, um, you know, a little bit of, of, of Lemberger, which is, is also Blau Frankish, um, which is kind of cool. It's, it's the, the grape itself is named after um, uh, King Charlemagne of, of the Franks, right? That's why it says Frankish and then and Blau meaning blue, it's just a, the deep color to it. Um, but I just, I love that, that wine is just so versatile with, with different, you know, food and wine pairings and, and absolutely great. So, and then of course, you know, your spot burgunder and then, you know, a little bit of Mignon and, and Schwartz Riesling. So, um, so Trollinger is, is Württemberg's premier red grape variety. Uh, it's almost exclusively grown there. Uh, it's, gonna, it's considered the Swabian national drink, which, which I didn't know, Amy probably did, but I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and I didn't know this too, that it is, um, it's the same grape variety as Schiava, which is, is native to Alto Adige, which Alto Adige is the northernmost growing region uh, in Italy. 
right? And it's kind of, it's, it's an Alpine region uh, that kind of borders, well, it borders, you know, in Germany and Austria and, and Switzerland um, and, and produces a, just a light bodied, you know, red wine, which is really good with uh, with cured meats that they do there. So it'd be natural that that it pairs really well with any kind of charcuterie and stuff like that. If you guys have any at home that you're, you're noshing on, uh, it'd be just a great pairing and just, you know, it's light, it's fresh, it's easy to drink. It's really versatile as an aperitif with different, you know, cocktail hour and stuff like that. So it's really kind of an exciting thing to, uh, to get into. And I love those, those light bodied, bright wines. Um, it just pairs with lighter cuisine. You can even do it with, you know, some kind of shell, shellfish, you know, even smoked salmon, smoked fish, uh, for sure. Uh, chicken, white fish, salmon, great with, you know, cheeses, stuff like that. Uh, so all of that for, for Charlinger is, is, is great. As far as uh, Lemberger is concerned, it's officially called Blauer Lemberger, uh, but also, you know, obviously we talked about, you know, Blau Frankish for sure is, is probably the most, most popular um, uh, uh, synonym for it. Uh, definitely getting a little bit more popular in, in the region. Uh, it accounts for 16% uh, for now of the vineyard area in, in Württemberg, which is a sizable amount. You know, it might not sound like a lot, you guys, but when you're starting to talk about other grape varieties that are being cultivated there, 16% is a really sizable chunk. So they're definitely doing some really cool stuff going on there with, uh, with Lemberger. Um, we have a little bit here in Wisconsin and we have some that gets really higher end, like uh, Grosses Gebeck territory. I wish I could bring it into the restaurant. It would definitely be a hand sell on my part. So we'd have to see how good I am with, um, with selling it. But I can only imagine that the wine has got to be absolutely fantastic. Um, and I hope that someday I'll get a chance to try it for sure. Um, yeah. And then just really kind of a versatile, you know, region as far as the styles that, that, that they produce and, and stuff like that. But, you know, with any of those grape varieties, I think that, you know, you're talking about stuff that's going to go with a multitude of different dishes and stuff that we do in the wintertime here in the Midwest, you know, like crock pot dishes and stuff like that, just really good with and, and different roasts and, and meats and, and cheeses. And there's just a lot going on there that, um, I think that there's a lot of wines that, you know, you pop them and they're only dedicated to this dish. Like I have to have you know, Cabernet with a steak or something like that. Whereas I feel like German red wine is just, it's so versatile. Um, and there's a lot of different stuff you can do with it. That's super fun. Especially when you start pairing reds with seafood, that's, that's like, like a no, no and, you know, classic sommelier pairings, but it's like, whatever, if it works, it works. And I think that's a really cool thing for sure. So um, I don't think there's really anything else to really kind of cover. I think that's about it. I think we can kind of jump into your, to your, your wine that you're presenting. Yeah. Yeah. We need to talk about this wine. This wine <laughs> It, you see the bottle shot on there is different than what you have. This is the 2019. Um, this is longtime favorite for me. Jochen Boyer is the winemaker. He is a former, this is, this is a wine of champions. He is a former BMX bike racing champion in Europe. And through the 80s, late 80s, he retired in like the early 90s. His family had always made wine. He returned to his winemaking roots. He is really focused on creating wines that showcase a place in terroir. And so if you have a chance to find his Rieslings, find them, love them, age them. They are lights out, super bright. I, <laughs> they are based on the soil type that they come from. I used to have one on the menu. It was called Schilfsenstein. And I have a really hard time saying it, Schilsenstein. His wines are focused and exact. They are so precise. I love that wine. The, the acid on that is just absolute like laser beams on that wine. He has a thing that he does with his labels. So all of his white labels are called breakfast wines. And all of his black labels are like serious dinner wines. And so something like this Trollinger for him, this is like a breakfast lunchtime wine. And for those of you that have it in your glass, you understand that, right? This wine is light bodied, tart, crunchy red fruit, super, super chuggable. Also, it's like, it, it's just like such a food friendly wine. The acidity lends itself really nicely to food pairings. That's why I put it on the menu. It's a lighter body even than Pinot Noir, as you see, because everybody has a Pinot Noir tonight. So if you take a look at those two colors, man, there is such a contrast. 
if you've had Schiava from Alto Adige, then you know this is pretty much in line with Schiava. But I find this one to be like a little bit more complex and have a little bit more depth. I would, I, and I can't, can't say enough about this producer because every wine I've ever had from him is out of this world. Um, at the restaurant, I love this wine because I would pair it with charcuterie. I would also use this as a red wine to pair with cheese and cheese can be really, really hard to pair with red wine specifically because if you have a wine that's too big and has too much tannin, it's just gonna destroy that cheese. This doesn't do this. You can enjoy this with a nice Alpine style cow's milk cheese. That's what I would do. There's a cheese in Minnesota and actually in Wisconsin, it's from Dodgeville, Wisconsin called um, Pleasant Ridge Reserve. It's the yeah. most award-winning cheese in American history, everybody. Get yourself some Pleasant Ridge Reserve and drink this Strollinger with it. I think it's perfect. Um, I would also utilize this on the menu for anytime we had white fish, because again, with fish, you don't want a wine that has too much tannin or too much alcohol. It's going to absolutely destroy that dish. And if you're only into red wines, this red wine is the thing for you to pair with those lighter dishes. It is just an absolute workhorse. And I also just think specifically for summer, give it a little bit of a chill, put it in the fridge for like 20 minutes to a half an hour. It's the perfect thing. It's the perfect red for the summer, isn't it? I just think it's just absolutely light bodied and delicious. It seems like, yeah, you chill that down and you have it with like the summer salad with like a strawberry vinaigrette and goat cheese and walnuts yeah. and stuff like that. would be just really good. Yeah. And there's a ton of strawberry going on in here. Mm -hmm. Not much for tannins. Oh, I love this wine. It's like a little bit candied. It's perfect. Steven, what is Steven saying down there? Steven's talking, he's, he's going, he's going off. He's going off on Lemberger in Wisconsin and suspecting yeah. that Carl Hadel sells, sells some of the Lemberger in the state. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, we don't have a ton, uh, but there is, there is a little bit and we tried to do it for this event. And I think that, I think it might be all in any, anything that Wisconsin can get is and maybe on the, on the East coast right now, we had a hard time bringing it in for December. So, uh, and yeah, and absolutely, you know, we talk about, you know, serving red wine, um, slightly chilled. And I think when you have something that has a, a lighter body to it and there's a little bit more acid focus, if it's, if it's served too warm, it just, all it shows is like alcohol and, and it kind of like masks the fruit to it. So I love red wine, like, like what we're serving tonight to be at like between 60 and 65. Um, and you guys at home, what I would recommend doing, you know, if you're, if you have your party and, and you, you know, you're going to drink your red, throw it in the fridge for like 15, 20 minutes. And then it'll be like perfect temperature when you're ready to serve it for sure. For that opening course, for your charcuterie, for your cheeses, stuff like that. What an awesome way to start dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Hope everybody loves the Trollinger. It's a special, special favorite of mine. Nice. Nice. Cool. Let's get into the falls. You want, we're talking faults. I love talking faults. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll, uh, I'll bat lead off here with faults. So um, really kind of a cool wine region. Um, I, we, anytime that we studied it, we, we would learn that it's, it's just right outside of, of um, Alsace, which is a region in, in France that we learn a lot about. And when we start, you know, learning about Alsace, we learn about, you know, Vosges Mountains and we learn about um, just how it's protected from, from mountains and it gets a lot of sunshine and it's got a lot of different soil types. And actually that kind of extends to the faults as well. Like it has, um, a lot of sunshine, which allows those grapes to ripen. Ripen. It grows a lot of different styles of, of, of grape varieties, and it does have definitely a, mo a mosaic of different soil types. When we, you know, we, we talk about certain regions that might just be, you know, strictly, you know, uh, blue slate or something like that. You know, this the fault isn't that they they offer a, a multitude of different uh, uh, different areas, and it's certainly one of the the warmest regions you know, in Germany, um, because of all that sunshine. So you get a little bit riper style of grapes, uh, which I think is a little bit more approachable for people that might are, are used to drinking new world wines, meaning stuff from the Americas and stuff. And where like a real cool climate German wine might kind of be a shock to the senses for them. It might have to like, kind of like ease yourself into those waters. The faults is kind of like, I think really approachable. Uh, and there's just a lot of different stuff going on. So, um, 
Riesling is definitely the most cultivated grape in, in the fall. And I think, I think they produce the most Riesling out of any uh, region, which you would think it's like, oh, it's got to be Mosul or it's got to be Rheingau. And it's not the case. It's actually the faults and um, uh, really just kind of a, a cool area. Um, yeah, it's, it's got 35% of its vineyards are dedicated to red grape varieties. I mean, that's a ton, you guys. Like when you're talking about a country that's so well known for producing uh, white grape varieties, I think that's a, it's a large chunk. And I think that, you know, as good as a Spapper Gunter is, as good as a Portuguese is from the falls. I think that, you know, they, they produce a lot of, uh, of Dornfelder, uh, which is a, is a wine that we're going to talk about here in, in just a little bit. And the uh, second most planted grape variety, you know, next to Spapper Gunter would be Dornfelder for sure. So I think we're just going to get right into that here because I have it and Minnesota doesn't, um, unfortunately. So uh, we're going to talk about, we got the Via Wolf by my guy, Ernst Lucen, who was really cool. I got a chance to meet him one time at a tasting and I didn't even know who he was. So I was kind of like going through my normal tasting stuff and I didn't realize I was, I was tasting with German royalty that day, uh, but just a really cool guy. And um, in addition to these brilliant, um, you know, Riesings he makes in the Mosul, he does have his project called Via Wolf, which is in the faults and, um, you know, does a little bit of dry Riesling down there, but also does his, uh, his Dornfelder, uh, which is a, a red grape variety. This particular one is made, um, it's slightly off dry, but, and when I say off dry, I mean that it has a little bit of sweetness to it, but it doesn't have this like mechanical, you know, adulterated sweetness to it that I found in red wine. It feels like it's just a little bit more natural and that the way that this wine is supposed to taste. Um, so it's actually the only off dried red that I have on my wine list at Bacchus actually currently and, uh, and it sells. I mean, you know, people ask for it. Um, and I think that, you know, red wine that has a little bit of residual sugar to it has its place in the food and wine pairing world, especially when you start talking about stuff that has a little bit of spice to it, because, you know, you can't always pair, you know, an off dry white wine with a dish that's spicy. Like sometimes you need a red that has a little bit of sugar content to kind of cut through that, that spiciness. And I think this is a perfect, you know, example for it. It's something that's, you know, it's not going to break the bank. Um, it's something that's super approachable. It's easy to drink. Um, and yeah, and you know, we talked about this one um, for our, our, our kind of holiday wine pairing one, Amy, and it, it's one that's versatile. It's one that works with a lot of different stuff. And we talked about that with, you know, like sweet potatoes and all these other different dishes. And I, I think it's just kind of a really kind of uh, interesting grape variety. Unfortunately, I haven't had a ton of other Dornfelders here in the Wisconsin market. And Via Wolf might have been like the only one that I've tried a few times, but um. I think it's great, you know, and it's from a producer you can trust uh, that does some really cool stuff for sure. So this is the 2019 Via Wolf. And this is one that uh, that they do carry at Waterford. And if you, if you do decide to, to come down to Bacchus for dinner and are, are interested in doing a bottle, you'll definitely find it on the wine list for sure. Um, yeah, I've had a couple others. I previously had one on my list from a Vine Group brand. And I think landed in the bottom, but I think that one came from the Vertenberg. Gosh, no, no, they're in the falls. That's my bad. Oh, too many regions, too many wines. Um, it was a Dornfelder from the falls from Weingut brand and brand makes a lot of different things. And that Dornfelder was weird and funky. And I did a tasting at the restaurant last year for consumers with that one. And we paired it with a lot of different charcuterie and it was like really robust and a little bit funky, super earthy dark, dark black fruits, a little bit like, like the wine's almost brooding. Mm -hmm. And the, I paired it with quite a few things that night, two that stood out the most, one was fermented turnip greens, get out of town, so good. And the other one was a pickled quail egg. And I just want to blow all of your minds with pickled quail eggs, pickled eggs at all. It, you know, I think that they're an acquired taste. Stephen was there. Stephen can attest to that. Um, pickled eggs with certain wines are the wine pairing that you don't think is ever going to work. And then you taste it and you go, what is happening? It's one of those pairings for me, at least, that it was like a one plus one equals 14. I couldn't even handle what was happening my one of my favorite pairings of all time actually is that pickled quail egg and that Dornfelder because 
some of my favorite pairings are the ones that I least expect. Like, mm -hmm. where did you come from? How did this happen? That wine blew my mind. And I already knew I liked the wine. I had it on the list. We featured it in that particular event. And that pairing was like, lights out. I can't even believe it. I love that. It, 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 those are the coolest ones. It's the ones where you're like, there's no way this is going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway. And you're just like, holy cats, like this is actually, this is perfect. Like this goes really well. And um, I would never think to do that pairing. So no. that's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. I didn't either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I will say this about Dornfeld too. I mean, you know, initially it was just kind of used as um, to add color to wine right? Yeah. Like it was, it was, it's kind of like this underdog grape variety that nobody really thought much of. And, and now it's, it's incredibly heavily planted in multiple, you know, regions in Germany. I think that's pretty cool. I think we always, you know, we got to kind of cheer for the underdog. We're all, we're all fans of Rudy here, right? <laughs> like, it sounds great. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Let's get into two more grapes. As long as we're in the falls, two more prominent grapes in the falls. One, none of us have wine in front of us. Um, one of my other favorites is Portuguese. -er. I have never had it in the red wine grape variety um, or in the red wine grape style. What I will say is Portuguese -er looks very similar to the Trollinger, like this super um, translucent, like bright, I guess I'd call it ruby, but there's certainly like a magenta undertone there. Portuguese -er is very, very light. You rarely see it in a still red wine. It's oftentimes used as a blending component to add a little bit more fruit and a little bit more lightness. And one of my favorite ways that I love it is in rosé. It's definitely a blending component in German rosés. And one of my favorites is from Fritz Müller, also in the false. No, oh, yes, false. Okay, Stephen will chime in on the false for that. Fritz Müller, if you've been to France 44, you know the Fritz Müller bottle because it's got the uh, white and black stripes on it. And it is a, we have it in rosé and we've got the little like slightly sparkling white as well. Most popular rosé ever sold at France 44. And that is almost all Portuguese. -er. It's super bright, super bubbly. Love, 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 love. Portuguese or in that regard. I have yet to have it as a still red wine, but it's on my list. Okay, I love that. Um, and then we should get into our next wine, which is actually made from Pinot Meunier, also called Schwartz Riesling in Germany. Pinot Meunier is originally from Burgundy and very, very well known in Champagne. Joe's going to go off on a tangent about the champagne situation pretty quick here but um today is primarily grown in the Württemberg. you've got a little bit in the false very oftentimes a blending grape but also like two percent of germany's total vineyard area um it's very rare that i've had a still pinot meunier joe do you want to talk us through the situation in champagne yeah. So, you know, we were kind of, Amy and I were having a, a conversation yesterday and just, you just being wine geeks, whatever. Um, so there's three grape varieties. Help right? it. Yeah. And we can't help it. Yeah. Um, there's three grape varieties in Champagne that we, uh, prominent grape varieties, right. And that's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and, and Meunier. And when we're, when we're the sommeliers, when we're first starting to study stuff, when you go to all these tastings and you're, you're reading stuff about Champagne, they all say the same thing. And then they're going to say that, you know, we, we use Chardonnay for, for acid. And we use Pinot Noir for the structure of the champagne. And we use Meunier for, for the fruit, right? And I never really knew that. I mean, I've had champagnes that had, you know, have Meunier, you know, uh, predominant, right? Like Mousset is one of my favorites and it's absolutely delicious. But I never really kind of put it together of like what the fruit uh, component of Meunier brought to the table until I drank one that was, you know, a still wine of 100% and checked it out on the starting. And we were just like nerding out on it yesterday about like how... Um, number one, just how elegant and the, the, the uh, it's like silky mouthfeel to it, but it has such a fruit component to it where now I understand why, you know, they add it to the blend of, of champagne to bring that fruit profile to it. I mean, it makes perfect sense. This wine like is absolutely fantastic. We had to kind of scratch and claw to, to get some for the tasting here in, in Wisconsin. And uh, I'm absolutely blown away. I love it. Um, I, if the story has any left, I'm going to have to fight people for it and buy the rest of it or something. It's really, really good. It's fun to drink. I mean, just really enjoyable as a cocktail wine, but I know it's going to pair with a lot of different stuff. So, 
Yeah, yeah. I think so too. I, again, previously had this on the list at the Batch Farmer. I actually poured this by the glass because I love this wine so much. Um, Darting has been around for hundreds of years. They have only, they previously, that's their family history. They previously sold to a cooperative and like 1989 or 1990, um, Helmut Darting took over and started making his own wine, you know? you can sell the grapes, but you could also make your own wine. So he took over, started making his own wine. The wines are like min minimal interventionist. Stephen says the winery is super special. I haven't been there, Stephen. It's on my list. Um, I love the fact that this wine is not pretentious. It is fruit driven, but it's still like rich and interesting. And again, I think it's going to pair really, really well with everything. I think it can hold up to some heavier dishes than maybe like the Trollinger. Um, I would certainly pair this with grilled meats. I would definitely pair this with lamb. I would definitely pair this with like in my head, I envision this with duck. That would be yeah. one of my number one pairings. Yep. Um, like a richer pate, a duck riad. I, I would pair this with pheasant. I think that this lends itself really well to um, game and like heavier dishes. I am stunned by this wine and I, you know, we got the 16 and I thought, okay, I better check it, make sure it's okay. The 16 is still out of this world. It is not, it's not trying to be something that it's not. It's just delicious. Yeah. I would love it with like a, like stroganoff. Or like yeah. um, like braised short ribs, or like there's all this stuff that I'm thinking about when you you know I had duck already put you know in my head and I tip of my tongue and then you said it and like yeah oh my god what a great pairing pheasant any kind of like wild game bird quail I mean it's yeah. so versatile it's just but it's just so fun to drink on its own right it's like every time you take a sip you want to go back for another one I mean that's the ideal kind of thing you're looking for in a wine right you either want to to, to make you want to take another sip or have another bite of food and and the starting definitely does that like i'm super jazzed about this wine like i'm really excited that it's part of this tasting i think it's yeah. awesome me too i'm really glad that you were able to get it and yeah, they don't make, <laughs> steven brings up a good point they make 20 different um varietal wines that's mostly wrestling, but they make a lot of different things and I think I, I've had a Riesling once and I will say that the winery itself does really deliver. I love this wine. Yeah, it's super cool. It really is. Amazing. Yeah. Hopefully you yeah. guys hear our enthusiasm about the darting menu. I, I know. We've got you all on mute, which I'm regretting right now because I like to hear what everybody else tastes. So if you want to type it in the chat, great. If you want to hold off until we get through this last wine, fine mm -hmm. too. No pressure, but also I want to hear what you think. And we got, All right, we're, let's get on. we're doing, yeah, we're doing good on time. So we should be able to have some good chat, you know, time at the, at the uh, very end. So, yeah. And then um, we're kind of, we're easing into, um, into the R, right? Yeah. Is that what we're getting into? The, the pirates into the R. region of Germany, the R, right? Yeah. Uh, bad dad joke. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what's there to say? So, I mean, it's such a small region and um, uh, a, a northernmost region, right? There, there's some people that consider it to be the North Pole of winemaking uh, in, in Germany, if not not the entire world. And, and one that focuses on, on such high quality um, spot burgunder and really an interesting, you know, wine region and on, on how it is. It's just, it, it, you know, steep slopes. Uh, you know, it's got the uh, Eiffel, you know, mountains that that form um, a, a rain shadow effect that kind of brings like more of uh, what we describe as a Mediterranean kind of climate to that region, which is unheard of for for a northernmost region. And you know, when you think of Mediterranean, you're kind of thinking of like that south of France. You're thinking of Italy and stuff like that. And it's really rare to have that um, that climate. It's only four percent of of um, vineyards. Uh, worldwide um, to have a Mediterranean climate. Napa Valley is one of them, you know, and stuff like that. So it's really strange that you would think that the R would, and, and the, the mountains have a lot to do with that. So when we talk about a phenomenon, you guys called rain shadow effect, I'm going to get geeky for just a minute, but it's really kind of cool to, to learn because it, it puts a lot together about different wine regions. So um, 
what a mountain would do like that is is kind of a cool effect on on wide regions so if you're if you're a cloud you know your number one job for your boss is to carry water <laughs> over to this place and dump it on it and, and and dump your rain on there right um so if you picture a cloud that's just kind of traveling with its water and it's going to dump it on the r um it's going to bump into the side of the mountain and then just dump all the water right there on the side of the mountain so the opposite side of it is going to maintain it's going to be dry and it's going to be warm um, a good example of that would be the the cascade mountain range in in washington if you think of seattle you think of it as just being cold and rainy all the time right well the opposite side of that you know in the eastern portion of washington is one of the most driest wine grown regions of the united states for sure so that's that's what a, a rain shadow would, would bring to the table so when you have mountain ranges like that much like the the vosges mountain range and, and alsace and then also extending into into the falls and that's the region why the falls is, is so warm and sunny and, and same thing with the r but really you know these steep slopes a lot of different soil types but predominantly you know kind of has this really kind of cool slate but also the lows and and it has like this gray wacky soil which you can find in actually new zealand of all places which i think is really cool um yeah i mean it's just it's one of the smallest regions in germany for 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 growing you know cultivating vine um but producing some of the highest quality that you can find for sure and and there's there's none higher quality than than the spot burgunder than the pinot noir that they're doing there um for sure i just think it's super cool to talk about and again it's something that we don't see a ton of here in in wisconsin but i think the more uh, that gets brought in, the more we can try with guests on um, just how good a quality it is and how much bang for your buck you get out of these wines. It's just, it's remarkable for me and, and really kind of cool stuff that that we're um, presenting. So I think Amy's going to talk a little bit about, about you know, Pinot Noir and Spoppergunder from Germany. And I think we're going to get into each of our wines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Spoppergunder is what the Germans call Pinot Noir. And it essentially means late Burgunder. So it's a late ripening grape from Burgundy, obviously. We've got this in our glass, right? Um, most important, as Joe said, dated earlier, most important red grape variety in all of Germany. It's third in production worldwide behind the United States and France. Obviously, we've got Burgundy there, right? I'm in love with this wine, so we're going to get to that in a minute, but I'm just like, I think it's opened up really well if you've had it in your glass for a while it's opened up just so, so well. If it hasn't been in your glass for a while, like give it a good swirl. I think the aromatics of this wine are really jumping out right now. Um, Pinot Noir has increased in um, plantings over the last three decades. And the majority of the plantings are in the Baden, which is down by Württemberg, also in the Württemberg in the falls and in the Rheinhessen. So that's where you're gonna find most of the Pinot Noir, mostly in the Southern part of the country, but also as Joe pointed out, the R is like pretty Northern, right? It's just that little rain shadow effect and that mountain range there that really make that climate suited for Pinot Noir, which can be really finicky. I'm sure you've all heard that, whether it's Oregon, California, Burgundy, Pinot Noir has got a little bit of an attitude and it's gotta have the right conditions. And the R, has the right conditions and I would even argue perhaps the perfect conditions for this great variety. Most Pinot Noir in Germany is vinified dry, which means it's a dry red wine, which is what you have in your glass. Ooh, and I do fully believe that this rivals Oregon, California, and if it had a little bit more oak on it, because Burgundy likes oak, California likes oak, if it had a little bit more oak, I would say like fruit condition here and quality of wine, this rivals Burgundy. I would just expect to have like a little bit more oak on those pieces, right? Um, German Pinot Noir has beautiful acid, really silky tannins, round, like full bodied fruit. On this one in particular, I'm getting a ton of cherry, but we'll get into that in a minute and like a really long, smooth finish. It's almost got like, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Joe, tell us about your wine first. My wine? I'm gonna go off because yeah. I, I love this wine so much. So what well, we're drinking here is the, the Julia Bertram. Um, she is just a rock star producer in the R. She's super awesome. So Julia Bertram, um, uh, her whole family's been winemakers um, for years and years, and and she um, 
started off with just having a super tiny parcel that she was, you know, gifted by her parents that she was able to work with. And she just kind of grew from there. Um, and then actually, you know, when she graduated high school, she went and interned actually at Meyer Nacle uh, in the R, which um, it's really cool for you guys in Minnesota to have that wine because it is like, I mean, I believe it's a producer that really kind of put Spapper Gunder on the map at, at, at just yeah. an international level, like really getting high acclaim um, and just awesome, awesome wine. So it's really cool that she, you know, has that tie and then she worked there. And then after that, it was really cool. And she was nominated um, German wine queen actually at a very young age, which is um, what, uh, which they give to, to people that are, are, are kind of like family, you know, winemakers that have a lineage of winemaking that are just starting off on their own journey. So she, she traveled worldwide for a year at a really young age as, as German wine queen and kind of like promoted German wines. And I think that is such a cool thing. And, uh, and then she started her own project and, and she's, she's making this wine that is like, you know, minimal intervention and, you know, showcases like this elegance and this minerality. But I, I have to be honest with you, like what we're trying right now, like, this is the second time I've had this bottle blown away by it. And there's it's seldom do I get like super really excited about a producer and about a wine, but this is like really complex and it's completely unlike anything I was really expecting from a German Pinot Noir. And it, it, it has this earthiness to it and it has this like brooding characteristic, but it's still light on its feet, like a ballet dancer. And it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm really digging this wine. The first time I had it, I think, um, for whatever silly reason, I didn't finish it the first day and I had it open the next day and it tasted just as good. So this is a wine that you can buy and trust that it's not going to go, you know, it's not going to oxidize or it's not going to go bad after, you know, being on the counter for a day if you don't finish it. Um, it's absolutely just, just delicious in my opinion. Like, I mean, these are the kind of wines that get me excited about being a sommelier and working in the wine industry, bar none, period. Yeah, you know? me too. And it is, you know, I think it's always been our job to like look for those things that maybe, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like Burgundy. I like Bordeaux. I like the fancy stuff, but also expensive wine, better tastes like expensive wine. And I think these wines come in at a price point that I'm in love with, right? I think they over deliver for their price point. Um, but also it's sort of our job to find things that are like either weird or one-offs and the truth with German red wine is that holy smokes do these wines absolutely deliver, which is why we should get into Meyer Nagel because in the chat, we're making really good points on all of these pieces. Meyer Nagel, I knew Meyer Nagel before I knew any of these other things, before I knew Joe, before I knew anyone. This was one of my favorite and first German wines I ever found. And I found Meyer Nagel in the Rosé first, which is all Pinot Noir, highly recommend it again if you can find it. It will be back in our market this year. I don't think it's in Wisconsin, as you said. The rosé is out of this world. It tastes like strawberry juice. I, that, <laughs> I had like a moment with that wine where I always thought maybe I don't like rosé. Maybe it's not for me. And I had that wine. It's so food friendly. It was amazing to have on so, that rosé taught me what rosé could be, right? It showed me that rosé is more than just like a patio pounder, not serious. Rosé can be really serious and it can be the focus of your meal. As a result of finding that rosé, I found this Pinot Noir. And this Pinot Noir for me is, first of all, we should talk about Meyer Nagel. So, you know, the father, Werner Nagel, um, has been making wine for years started in, I think the early eighties when the R was not known for premium winemaking, no one took them seriously. Werner really put the R and Meyer Nagel put the R on the map as a serious wine producing region and also a serious red wine producing region. This is serious Pinot Noir. This wine means business. And I think that if this same wine had like a uh, Sonoma Coast label on it, I think you'd be paying double or triple for it because the quality of this wine is outrageous. Now his two daughters have taken over, Micah and Dort have taken over. So our Pinot Noir session here, all female winemakers, which I freaking love, awesome. and they are kicking all the butt. Like this wine is serious. It doesn't have oak on it, but what you get in it is this depth of fruit and there's like this richness, but also because of where they are, it's 
get it? R, cute. I didn't mean to do that. Um, because of where they are, it's also super bright, super elevated, and it's like extremely elegant. The nose on it is incredibly aromatic. It's absolutely popping out of the glass. I, I've always loved this wine, but I'm just really enthralled with it this evening. I think that it's, it's showing so well. The fruit is gorgeous and it's a serious wine. And I think that it shows a lot of skill in winemaking just as Julia's does. And it's important to note that the two sisters, Micah and Dort studied all over the world, you know, New Zealand, Burgundy, Portugal, and they brought all that knowledge back to their home to where their father's been making wine. And I think that it shows in this wine. This is an experienced complex wine. And I hope you love it as much as I do because I'm really just, I'm digging on it. Joe, you're gonna have it. You are gonna have no, it. No, we actually, time. no, we do have Meyer Nickel. We do. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, good. we do. Yeah, we have it. Um, and, and again, it's probably something that, you know, we, we do have a, a pretty extensive um, Pinot Noir list uh, mm -hmm. at the restaurant. And um, uh, right now we have a uh, Whitman's Popper Gunner that we pour uh, and it, it sells and people really enjoy it. But I think that if you're adding like, you know, Bertram, Meyer Nacle and stuff like that, it's kind of taking a little bit of a, of a step up. Um, yeah. And I think the guests are really going to enjoy it. And um I love hand selling wines like this because there's just there's so much love that goes into these wines that it's really easy for us to 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 share our compassion with them to the guests, right? Like I think so too. Yeah, I think totally. You know, and, and at first you're like, you know, guests are like, oh man, because you know, buying wine is such a calculated gamble, and mm -hmm. you want to you want to go with something that you know, you know, you but you can be so rewarded if you just take that little bit of a gamble, you know. And then the next thing you know, you're just, you're diving in this rabbit hole. That is just this beautiful thing of, of, uh, of German Pinot Noir. And you made a really good point. It's like, you know, if this was a dip from a different region, if this is Sonoma coast or, or whatever. Yeah. You're paying double yeah, Easy, for, sure. for sure. You know, just for a region on the wine label. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the quality, you know, is, is better than a lot of, you know, Sonoma coast wine producers for sure. I not, totally not agree. bad about that region. I love Sonoma coast Pinot, but. Nope, nothing against them. I believe that so much. Fun fact, I'm doing a private tasting next week where I'm blinding the client on a Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir and also this Meyer Nacle. So I'm wrapping up the bottles for them. That's a fun thing for you to do at home over the holiday or whenever. I'm, I'm putting together a package for them where they're going to blind these two wines side by side. And I want to know if they can tell the difference. And also... Which one do you like better? Who's your Sonoma Coast producer? Can you say? I can say uh, it is Fela. Oh, I love Fela. Not a ton of oak on that one. And yeah, I'm intentionally great. doing it because I think there's so many misconceptions about German wine and German red wine. And they were game to like play along. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wrapping up some bottles for them and they're going to do a side by side and we'll see what they like better. That's Boy, how that's much I Fela, yeah. Fela Sonoma Coast for Meyer Nick, it, that's going to be pretty close. I know. You know. Aaron Jordan does a lot of really cool stuff that's more like kind of old world-esque, I would say. And that's why I, I really dig Fela, but yeah, that's yeah. cool. And like this it. one is out of this world. And so I'm really, really excited for that tasting, but I'm also really excited about uh, German Pinot Noir because... I think this wine in particular, and obviously Julia's wine too, which I haven't had yet. That's not in our market. Um, I think that they showcase really high quality winemaking. Without a doubt. And I think that there's this misconception that if you're getting a, a, a Pinot Noir from Germany, it's just going to be this watery, like crunchy and like astringent. You know what I mean? Like they just think it's such a cool climate that it's not, it's not going to be good. And these wines are absolutely remarkable. When you taste them at this quality level, you're just like, I, I'm continuously blown away by them. Which, you know, I mean, we do this, you know, Amy and I, you know, I know it sounds like it's a really rough job, but we, you know, we drink wine for a living, right? This is what we do. We study and drink wine. And, and when we find a producer that really um, does that to us, like it's, it, they're few and far between. And, and I can't say enough about Pinot Noir being produced in, in Germany right now. Like it's pretty gangster for sure. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. So with that, we've hit our 733 and we should see... If anybody wants to talk, and we should do another cheers, because I'm a big fan of cheersing. Prost, everyone. Cheers. 
Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Delafield. Thank you, Wines of Germany and Stephen and Danielle who are with us tonight. Thank you, France 44. And then like unmute yourself. Let's have some questions. Let's talk about Germany. So I have a question well, uh, from Delafield store. Most of the people come in, you know, my biggest challenge is when people come in, they say, oh, I want a wine for this and they like Pinots or something, you know, are we going to carry um, the darting um, or the Julia Bertrand at, at uh, Delafield? And I know you said duck, lamb, because that's pretty common with the holidays coming up. Um, what recommendations can you give? So that's a, couple questions there but um yeah. are no, we those are great those? questions are Here's what I think. Those? and then when people come in i have a holiday gathering you know bam that that's my challenge where i see i want to recommend these wines excellent you guys these are excellent wines so good i'm you glad you like them i think to answer your questions um jackie if you're confident in being able to sell these wines i'm sure ben has no problem stocking them and i certainly don't because I think that's why we do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't talk about it, but God, how good would that wine be with like a holiday ham? Right. I, that's what it, I was, I was actually, sure. I was trying to think right. of holiday things. Yes. Totally. Right. It's going to go well with all of that. And especially when you're eating, doing a lot of eating and stuff like that, like you don't, you don't want a really full bodied wine. You don't want something that's pushing 16% alcohol. It's just going to weigh you down and put you to sleep. You need something that's lighter. That's more, you know, it has, it has a little bit of vibrancy to it and it has some energy and it's just going to keep you going through the party. And these well, wines do. This, this, from what you say, these wines can carry you from the appetizer course all the way through, totally. you know, it can until you know, through the main course too. 100%. And I, I think, unless you're having, you know, something, you know, like a steak or something, I don't know. But the, I mean, I think these, uh, these wines are ver very versatile and I'm thinking holidays and I hope we can stock these in because I'd like to steer people like more of an educational, you're right, they don't like to take that leap. Uh, a German red wine, eh, I don't think mm -hmm. so, but they don't like to take that leap. They're, yeah. they're safer with the, you know, the California or the Oregon, um, but yeah, this yeah. would be, you know, wonderful. So that's a really good point. So I had somebody that was shopping. I was actually at the store yesterday, just randomly popped in from to do Joe stuff. And um, there was a guy that was looking at Oregon, which is one of my favorite wine regions in the world. I absolutely adore Oregon Pinot. But I'm like, hey, listen, if you're if you're shopping Oregon right now, you got to try this Bertram, you know, Pinot Noir from from Germany. He's like Germany, and he kind of gave me that look. I'm like, trust me. Yeah. And that's all I did. Is so sometimes I think that confidence just sells it. I, mm -hmm. I know that confidence sells it, right? If you're like. When, when I drank, when I tried the, when I tried the Bertram, I thought Oregon right away. Yep. I mean, that was my, yeah, I did. I, I thought more Oregon, um, very comparable to that. So I, I, I think that that would be, you know, and that's me. I'm very unsophisticated in my palate compared to you guys. But I mean, I think that that's, that's what I thought. But I think I wrap, this is something that you could sell if those people are gravitating towards those, those wines. So anyway. If Amy's blind tasting Myronaco versus Fela, I want to blind taste the Bertram yeah. next, to Irie, mm -hmm. next to Irie, you know, and I just, I think that they're so similar and they, they would really kind of change right. people's opinions, right? I think it'd be a really cool thing to do. Right. I do too. That would be that would be interesting. So I'm making from from another place where, like, I think the the fun thing about today's tasting is you know y'all are all joining from a place you know the Upper Midwest that is so you know Germanic heritage and culture right, yes. is so important and so it's such a fun party. Like you could know nothing about German wine, but it's such a fun. Like, I mean, obviously, maybe not in COVID, but to show up to someone's house for a dinner party or a holiday party and say, I brought you a German Pinot. That's all you need to know about the wine. You could, like, lose everything we lost today about kind of all this great knowledge. But, like, how fun is it to show up to, oh, like, my last name is Schmidt. So if someone's coming to my house and they showed up, like, your last name is Schmitz, we clearly know you're German or somewhere down the line. Like, how fun would it be to show up to something with, like, to a nod to someone's heritage? I think it's a really thoughtful gift and so you know i'm joining from you know central texas another place of dominant germanic heritage and i just think that it's a it's almost a fun party favor as much as it is interesting right. and good wines too that's a really good point what do you guys think show up with some brown schweiger and some uh spot burgunder it'd be a pretty cool thing to do and here yeah. in, in milwaukee yeah, yeah my mom's side of the family is meyer and so i brought this maybe two Christmases ago. And my grandma was just like, 
she couldn't believe that I found a wine that had Meyer on the label. But, you know, when you're dealing with, I mean, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we've got a lot of Germanic. Lots of German, yeah. Here, and like this fun, cool little, as Stephen said, it's almost like a party favor. And side note, we enjoy those foods and these wines go with those foods. And so I will say that it's not only a party favor, but like it goes with what you're having for dinner too. Oh, this is Kamala. I have a question. Um, are these three carried then at France 44? So like if we wanted to get them again, are they all available? They will be available. So right now, all I have is the spot burgunder on the shelf because I wanted to make sure I had enough of the other two for this tasting. So yes, uh -huh. they will be. I will say with the Boyer, that's going to be, there were only a certain number of bottles available. And so I, I hid them all. And, but they will be on the shelf, but there's only maybe like eight left period. Um, oh, wow. but yeah, yep. At least for this vintage, you know, next vintage, hopefully we'll have a little bit more. Um, well, I know, I know with Yokin that the quality is going to be there. So I would want to have this on the shelf. Um, they will be on the shelf maybe as early as tomorrow. Okay. For sure. The Meyer Nickel is there. And also if you pop in the store, I'm always there. I'm just not always on the floor. So you can ask for me and we can talk about the rest of the German wine lineup too, because it's really stellar. And um, the, the, um, the Pinot Meunier, is that how you say it? Meunier. Yep. The Meunier. yep. You have, do you have, a, I'm still learning all the terms here. So <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> there will be more of that on the floor probably tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks yep. so much. Yeah, this I hit them great. Good. I wrote in the chat, but I'm wondering if everybody will chime in with their favorites. I want to see which one wins because it's a real toss up for me. This one. Which one? Yeah, I want to see which one wins. Like who likes what the best. It's a real toss up for me. Um, I love all three for different things. Um, the darting, the Spapagander, the Pinot Meunier. I love that you love the Pinot Meunier because that's one mm -hmm. that like a lot of people don't know. Kim, you like the Burka or you like the Trollinger? I love that. I hope your cat is enjoying the box. The Meyer Nakel, Morgan Meyer. The Meunier, yes. Very cool. And how That's many awesome. people, I love this gallery view. This is like my life. Me too. How many people, how many people have ever had a Pinot Meunier before? Anybody? No. Yeah. No? Yeah. No. Okay. That's really exciting. I had never had a still Pinot Meunier until I had that one either. Yeah, and me too. I think it's awesome. It's so good. It's so cool. Yeah. And they, it just, like I said, it just it puts that all in perspective of the whole like champagne grape varieties. But I mean, it's absolutely delicious. All you want to do is just kind of keep going back to it. And every sip is like, God, this is delicious. I just want to keep drinking it, you yeah. know? From the Potts region in Germany, so I've had it before. Not not uh, the the darting, but uh, I don't know what it was, but I had. But yeah, <laughs> so that's so great. Yeah, I think we're all familiar with it in Champagne, at least. Um, and if you're not, then that'll make you search out Pinot Meunier there as well. Yeah. Uh, but and going back to it now, Amy, and it kind of has like this like. Almost like if you rip open a packet of like grape Kool-Aid and just smell it, <laughs> I don't know if you get that, but I love that. It's got this definitely, it's just, it's a fruit bomb for sure, um, yeah. but still has this minerality and it has this earthiness. Like it's not just, it's not one dimensional. Like it, it has a lot of different depth and characteristic to it. And I think you can tell, like after you take a sip of it, it's just, it's still hanging out, you know, yeah. in the back palate and just, it just wants to hang out and, and party with you for a little bit. Yeah, yeah it lingers. And I love that it's, at least for Minneapolis people, this is a 2016. And mm. normally I would say this wine should be drank young and it's four years old and it's absolutely holding up. This one, I agree with you on the whole like grape Kool-Aid packet. There is like a lot of like blue black fruit going on here too. So there's certainly red fruit, but there's a lot of different things happening in this glass. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'm so happy to see that you've all gotten a chance to try something different. It's very exciting. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I just want to, you know, I think that was one of the nicest parts about this was feeling like we were trying new things and that they were really right. good and that we'll return to. So yeah. thanks so much. Yeah, that's what I like. I'd be interested in, in uh, doing some, a, a tasting like what you're doing, doing the the Oregon a Pinot and then having the Sonoma and then having uh, the German. That would be very, very, very interesting and doing something like that if you guys ever were interested in doing that. Well, really I cool. think we- or maybe I'll just do it myself. I'll just go buy it. <laughs> there you go. I'll do it. That's <laughs> really you uh, add France to that too. You could do- yeah. The Oregon, California, exactly. and Germany would be super fun. And yeah. add a Burgundy, right? Yes, mm -hmm. that would be really good. Yeah, we can do blind well, Pinot Noir. <laughs> we can. Um, all you gotta do is just tempt uh, Ben the Waterford guys for like for a free lunch, and then we will just you know supply all these different wines. To try. <laughs> yeah. right. oh. so we'll You're it. here. But, but you guys, I have to say <laughs> that I really enjoyed the German aspects of both yeah. of these things the one that you did uh last month we had a little issue with the uh, live instagram mm. so certainly if you had time or pursuing the german line even more i think that's probably one region that we're not very familiar with so no. i really appreciate this a lot so thank that's you true. Yeah, this was fantastic oh good we, really was i am a longtime german wine lover and it continues to surprise me as well and so um it's always something I'm interested in going down and luckily for me, Joe is a great partner. And so we can hopefully do that together. I love the idea of having Wisconsin and Minnesota on the same, um, on the same session. And I actually had a family reach out and they were like trying to coordinate with their family in each place to make it happen for both of them. And I think maybe so we cool. do, I want to do like blind Pinot Noir next. Oh, That sounds really fun. Yes. Yes, yeah. let's do Pinot you know, Noir. Let's do that. That'd be yep. great. Absolutely. Everybody's into it. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to do it by myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll join you, Jackie. We'll join right, you. I know. <laughs> I know. So. Yeah, All I right. think that you know, Amy's been one of the, my, the most favorite you know, people that I've, I've presented and work with for sure. So we got to do some more stuff in 2021. And, um, you know, like your baseball team's better or football team's better. Like we both got bragging rights and whatever, but you know, I know. <laughs> we, we still play nice in the sandbox together, which is great. <laughs> I feel like we're always gonna, we always have that rivalry. I don't really feel mm -hmm. like we have it in hockey or basketball, but for baseball and Football, yeah, we're always gonna have basketball, that. we got it right now, and and we don't have a hockey team, right? Like we got the Admirals, oh. which is you know. come on, you got the Badgers. I am drinking out of my Badger uh, wine glasses oh. right now. Okay, so, all right. We should battle for Paul Bunyan's axe here next. Oh <laughs> God, I'm I'm very worried for that actually. <laughs> I thought they canceled. We're getting off topic. I thought they canceled, <laughs> but also we're getting off topic. But we could do go for Badger hockey game wine night. Yes. We have to come up with the theme for that. Yeah, uh, we'll have to do like the ice wines. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question. German ice wine. Um, if yeah. uh, for somebody that's never traveled to Germany, um, are any of these wine regions or any other particular wine regions particularly fun to go visit or quite yes. tourist friendly? All of them. <laughs> That is a great well, question. Have I have been to Germany. So, they have wine, so I thought, you know, that's fun, right? I, yeah, that, and, and Stephen chimed in saying, yeah. yes, I like, I'm sure they're just, they got to be incredibly charismatic yeah. and just really just. Yeah, just, I think we should, like, let Stephen handle this. Yeah, no, they're definitely tourist friendly. I think when people think of, like, traveling to Germany, it's either for business or yep. for some like river cruise, right? And mm -hmm. both are great and fun. Um, the beauty of Germany is that essentially all the wine is next to a river and frankly, a lot of it's next to the Rhine. And so mm -hmm. you do happen, a lot, happen upon a lot of wineries. Um, I will say of the ones we've had today, Darting, where the Pinot Meunier is from, has a very fabulous like, um, like American style sort of visitor place. And what I mean by that is like Europeans, they don't go to wineries like we do. Like 
You don't, there's not a tasting room in every winery in Europe, whereas in America, there's a, there's a tasting room even when there's no winery. So that, that, that culture is not, um, that's very, it's a very American activity, frankly. That being said, both Darting specifically, but also Meyer Nackel, fabulous places to visit um, with, you know, yours, all of your sort of, all of what you'd expect from a visit to a winery. The others, I'm sure, have some sort of thing to go do and taste, but they might be a little more, how do I say this delicately, like grassroots than, than might yeah. what you'd make it expect from a, your typical Napa, Sonoma, Oregon winery. I use the word rustic. Rustic, great word for that, yeah. <laughs> but also, if you go in the fall or during the wine harvest season, there is a lot of just about every village, every town has the wine fests. Mm -hmm. oh. so you, and those are usually a lot of fun. Some of them are bigger, crazier. It's like the, like the almost, in, especially in Bad Durkheim, where darting is, there is... Um, the, it's called Bad Durkheimer Wurstmarkt, which is comparable to the um, Oktoberfest, basically. Oh, oh boy. That's yeah, so what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, always hear, you always hear about Oktoberfest, but you never hear about the wine, the wine, the yeah. wine, the wine side of it in Germany. Oh, well, in, in Oktoberfest in these regions is beer, is wine, not beer. So, you know, oh, I mean, it's... it's... I said the, the, the Wurstmarkt in Bad Durkheim, where Darting is, that is comparable to, yeah. you know, to oh. it's not it's not an Oktoberfest and I don't even think it's in October or it's several weekends only so only on the weekends but yeah well it sounds like we have some exploring to do right yeah, I'm gonna go sure. to Alsace I'm gonna go to the Alsace yeah it's both. wow okay amazing you've all done so well I'm glad you enjoyed the wines I'm glad we got oh, to thank you at the end um, of course, reach out to myself. I'm Amy at France44.com, or you can reach out to Joe, or I can connect you with Joe. Either way, I'm sure most of you Wisconsinites already are in contact with Joe. Yeah. Um, but find us if you need anything. We're happy to help. And thank you for being here. We appreciate all of you. And drink more German wine. That is our that is our quest. What a great tasting. And thank you guys for being so engaging with it. And we were able to showcase um, such wonderful wines. And like, thank you for, for giving us, um, you know, our, our soapbox or, or stage where we can just like passionately describe like stuff that we're really excited about. And Amy and I love doing stuff like this. So thank you for giving us like a, a voice to, to showcase our passion and stuff. We're really, we're really jazzed. Hopefully, hopefully you guys found something new today and you're like, oh, I never thought it would be like that. And now I'm going to be drinking this wine and and tell my friends about it, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, we're ready for you. Joe and Amy, do it again. Do it again. Yeah. Do it again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Have a good yeah. night. Thank Happy guys. holidays, Thank everybody. Happy Cheers. holidays. So. Have a great night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. If I can have another, uh, just a last question. Sure. So um, just looking at the map, uh, there is this one region which is in the far uh, left corner, Saxony. Mm -hmm. So far northwest, uh, northeast of Germany. So probably it's a kind of a close to what we have uh, condition, kind of climatic conditions like um, in the uh, upper Midwest. I was yeah. just curious, um, do you know anyone? I mean, what do they grow there? Um, hardly any of those wines come to America. I know they're growing Riesling. Um, I know there's Muller Thurgau. Joe, what else do you know? I don't. So, you know more than I do. A little bit of Pinot Noir in both of them. That mm -hmm. I do know. You know what I think they would probably do would be just like really cold, hearty varieties, yeah. right? Like, like like cross varieties, probably. Okay. There's no. Pinot Noir, there's Riesling, and there's Miller Turgau there for sure. Mm -hmm. But we hardly see, because those regions don't have a lot of um, land under vine, we yeah. hardly see any of that wine here. So 
2021, I'm going to Germany and I'm going to seek out those wines specifically because I want to see what they do. Because I don't sure. know very much about it either because they don't show up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I was just curious. I mean, it's uh, it's a close yeah. to Dresden, so so I was thinking. I mean, just uh, probably the northernmost of all the regions, north and east. So that might have been something which we might have here. Yeah, it really is. Um, it's it's cooler because it doesn't have the same effect that what we were talking about with the R. You know, they've mm -hmm. got of this Mediterranean climate based on that rain shadow and those mountains in front of them. And they don't have that. So it is certainly, it's a little bit more north and it is a little bit cooler. And there, I mean, there's information out there, but there's just not as much because there's not as much wine coming out. Yeah. And a question for Joe. So um, in terms of, uh, if you look Germany, I mean, so we have uh, France and Burgundy to the west and uh, 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 Austria to the, the south and east. So um, how would you compare Austrian and German wines? And also, I mean, you have like the Bohemia in, 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 in between. So yeah. is there any continuity there or it's mostly kind of a looking towards Burgundy, like Pinot based and the rest no, is- No, you know, I, I think that's a great question. I think that's there's got to be a reason why they don't cultivate more Pinot Noir in Austria, but what they do, you know, cultivate is a, a Pinot Noir crossing of, of Saint Laurent called Zweigel, and they do that in Blaufrankisch for their red wines. They do a little bit of Merlot and stuff like that, but predominantly a white wine region. And the reason that comes out of Austria, and Amy can back me up on that. She knows how much I love Austrian wine, and I wish I was an Austrian wine ambassador too. Uh, <laughs> love the wine region so much um and there's certainly comparisons that that can be laid to, to german wines in in their dry but the the dry reasons that are coming from germany taste differently than the dry reasons from uh from austria there's reasons for it you know what i mean there's there it's um climactic influence soil type it's the way that they're done um and ripeness levels but they're they're always delicious i love austria wine it's, it's probably uh, you know next to germany my favorite wine region mm -hmm. in I mean, France, right? But um, just remarkable. But it, it is kind of interesting that they do do different grape varieties. The only singular um, red variety that they share um, is Blaufrankisch, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't think they do any Schiava or Lemberger. Um, they have a little uh, Schiava and Trollinger in, yeah, in Austria. Lemberger, no Trollinger. Right. Part of the reason they don't do Pinot Noir is because they have Saint Laurent. And then right. Maybe exactly. Riesling, right. And then, um, I mean, Sauvignon Blanc crosses over a little bit with the false. Mm -hmm. um, they make great Sauvignon Blanc and in, 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 in Sud Steiermark for sure, right? Like, I mean, some of the best of the world. Yeah. Gilbert Muscatel crosses over. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. It's interesting because the, all the grapes don't cross over. I mean, it's yeah. certainly soil differences. It's certainly climactic. Riesling crosses over, of course. But Joe, you make a really great point. I can tell the difference between Austrian Riesling and German Riesling. They yeah. are dramatically, dramatically different for all of those reasons. You know, I think that Austrian wine takes maybe more of more of, uh, of an influence of Hungarian wine than it does yeah. German wines. It's closer to Hungary, maybe. I think so too. So it's know. East Austria. I mean, I would imagine kind of a Vienna and east of it. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at Austria, the country is kind of shaped like a key and the key like goes into the Alps. So like most of the wine region is, is not cultivated to vine. It's, it's basically on the, on the Eastern portion. Um, and then the Northern Eastern portion is white and then the middle is red and then Southern is white again. It's really kind of interesting. Um, it, it's a fun dive and they're great wines and um, I absolutely love them. And if you were to go, to go downstairs and look at my, my wine collection, it's probably, I'm not kidding you, probably 25% dedicated to Austrian wine. Oh. And one last question. Uh, so of these which we had today, which one is earth aging, kind of putting away for a couple of years? Or Because they're, they're actually, I mean, all of them are very approachable, very low, kind of a very mild tannin. So, I mean, yep. they're basically drinkable right now, but would you, mm -hmm. would you age them or... Yeah, I think both those Pinot Noirs can go for a little bit. I think the Meyer yeah. will probably longest, right? But the I think Meyer the Nacle, sure. yeah. Go ahead, Amy. But the, the Meyer Nacle for sure. I think you could put this away for 
quite a while. What um, I know you're in Minneapolis as well. So they have a higher end bottling even, and I've mm -hmm. never had it called blue slate. So mm -hmm. it is on a blue slate soil. It's got a very, very different um, like minerality component to it. And it is like a higher end Pinot Noir for them. I think this one is like 40 on the shelf and the blue state might be 60. Wow. Um, both of them are worth aging for sure. I wouldn't, the Boyer, even though I love it, is meant to be drank young. Of course. Um, it's fruity. It's like the, the darting, surprisingly enough, I didn't think the 16 was going to taste this good. I got it by accident and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to return this wine. Like, where is it at? This wine is showing up really well. I wouldn't age it for what, you know what I would do? And what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to buy three bottles. I'm going to yeah. buy one for next year, see where it's at. And if I have to drink it, then I'm going to drink it then. Otherwise I'm going to hold it and like check in on it every year and see how it's doing because it's held up better than I thought. And granted, I know he's a high quality producer. This wine, as I know it, has always been such a fruit bomb. And in those cases, when wines are just fruit, I always think maybe I can't age it that long. But yeah. I, I think you buy a few bottles of this and hold it for a little bit. I think it's going to do really well. Perfect. It would be interesting, right? Like I, I like to drink older wine and yeah. I think that you, you know, it just, it's a fun journey and I think you can be surprised like there's times where I bought like just a super old bottle of like Foradori that's cheap and it's just like it was 10 years old and it's like wow this wine is showing amazingly and I think that that darting can probably it has so much acid to it mm -hmm. you know if you look at acid as a preservative yeah why wouldn't it go right like you're, you're gonna lose fruit but then you're gonna pick up secondary notes yeah. you might get like some more like mushroom stock or some more earthiness to it I mean, what's wrong with that, right? Like, yeah. obviously, like European wine. So I think that's a great thing. Yep. And there's so I think that the Pinot Noir can go a long time. Yeah. And, re and remind me, you had the Maya or the Darting on the shelf in Minneapolis at France 44? Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll have them all on the shelf. Right okay. now, I only have the Maya Nacle. I had to, like, hold these other two to make sure I had enough for the class. Because um, the Boyer is very, very limited right now. Tomorrow afternoon, I'll have them all on the shelf. Perfect. Perfect. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you so much. I mean, we're, yeah, pleasure having you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. So I'm in love with this Pinot Noir. I wish I could have it, but I mean, I wish you could have this bird, this bird sham. I'm not kidding you. Like, I'm super yeah. fucking jazzed about this wine right now. Like, I'm going to like hammer the rest of this bottle. It's so good. It is delicious. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think hey, it went really well. Time. Yeah, I think it went great. Great job. Um, I'm really excited that at the end, like right at the end, every, nobody's engaging the whole time. Mm -hmm. I was thinking like, oh my God, no one is talking. That's part of the reason I don't like using a slideshow is I think that it stifles engagement. Mm -hmm. Because when it's gallery view, people start talking. Yeah, the gallery view is the, the thing about it is, like, yeah. even my, in my thing earlier today, like everybody was apprehensive to chime in and I gave them opportunity. I'm like, hey, listen, like there's no like stupid question. Like if you're going to ask something, somebody else is thinking that too. And people are just like apprehensive yeah. to do that. They're like, I don't want to sound stupid, right? So I think what you need to do is you need to loosen them up with a little bit of wine first. And then they start, then everybody has a, a, an opinion. Right. Well, and when it's gallery view, when you ask a question, you can already see, like you see heads nodding and you see, mm -hmm. or heads shaking. Right. And yeah. so I think gallery view is key. I'm, I'm happy we put this together, but also I was so worried at the beginning. And what? then at the end, when they're like, do another one, do another one. Oh, I'm yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's really hard, right? So like when you're presenting like that, it's like you understand what it's like to be like a stand up on stage, right? Where nobody's clapping at your jokes and you're like, fuck, I'm bombing right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you just got to keep rolling yeah. with it. Like you have no choice. You have to keep going. Yeah. Yep, you have to keep going. I, I didn't get that feeling tonight though. Honestly, like I think that 
the, I don't know, this was a different presentation than what we had before, which I thought was, I was drinking more for the last one prior. This one I thought was really well done, Amy. I really do. Like I thought, I thought it was like, you know, to the point it was direct, it was engaging, but it was, it was also like, it wasn't super geeky. Um, I really like what we did tonight. I thought it was great work, honestly. Seriously. And I think Danielle brought up a good point about um, the pronunciation. I think we could do, I'm going to have to modify this recording too, so that people don't get all of this. Here, I'm going to stop recording. Yeah, definitely do that. <laughs> Just keeps going.